welcome uh, Sophie Grace Chapel. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Nick. Um, I'm going to uh, talk from <clears throat> a chapter of my book, so um, I won't be able to see your faces. Well, I will be able to see them, but I won't be looking at them most of the time that I'm talking. Um, I apologise for that, because normally when I give a talk, I want to be face to face with my audience. So I want to be looking you in the eye and seeing whether what I'm saying is making an impression. And if so, what kind of impression? But I can't do that, <coughs> excuse me, and look at my script. So I'll mainly look at my script until we get to discussion. Um, one housekeeping matter, uh, not all of you, I can see because I've got the chat panel open, have muted your microphones. If you mute, mute your microphone when you're not speaking, then the quality will improve and I'll maybe a little bit be a little bit less grainy and there's less likely to be a glitch. So it's worth doing just for technical reasons. And also if, if um, the dog makes some deeply embarrassing noise while I'm talking, it won't show up on the tape. Um, preserved forever. Um, okay, so it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm going to do something I've never done at the Barnes Philosophical Club before, and that's keep to time. Um, before I say anything substantive, though, um, about the talk this evening, I want to begin by recalling all the happy previous occasions when I've spoken at the Barnes Philosophy Club. It's been a wonderful gift and a wonderful experience to be involved with you over well, I, I don't know how many years, maybe seven to eight years now. I've really enjoyed it. Um, you're a wonderful group of people. And at this point, the reason why I'm talking about this today is because I particularly want to underline the contribution that Barbie and Simeon have made to your magnificent, your truly magnificent you're here. philosophical club. I think what Barbie and Simeon have done in setting this up and getting it going and now handing over to Nick is just extraordinary. I really do. I think it's great. And so a huge round of applause to both of them. And long may it continue under new management. Um, but I, I see Barbie and perhaps Simon as well are both here tonight. So um, great to have you with us. Okay, so for the last three years, I've been uh, researching a book. And writing a book and um, I got a Leverhulme Research Fellowship in 2017 to pursue this research project which um, I was really rather surprised by because they're, they're quite quite a big deal so I was very pleased when that came up and absolutely thrilled and I thought right well here we go I've got three years to write a book oh my goodness and then all kinds of vertigo take over um, but now uh, at the end of those three years, I've written a book of 220,000 words. And because Epiphanies has um, two E's in it, and the first of them is capital, my laptop is actually wearing out. Um, and in particular, the E key is wearing out in it. So if I say it's a pleasure to come here, to come her to you, or something like that, it's because my E is failing, because I've used it so often. In the last three years. So I've written this monster book. Um, it's almost ready to go to the publishers. I'm actually hoping to dump it on an unsuspecting OUP this very week. <coughs> so I should be ready to talk about it by now and I should be ready to say something about what Epiphanies is about and that's what I'm going to try and do this evening and then off it goes to OUP and we'll hope that OUP's readers are kind to it. There's a thing in academic philosophy, we, we talk about reviewer one and reviewer two, or referee one and referee two. When people referee or review our papers or our book manuscripts, um, the editor of the journal always gives you the good news first. So that you, you get two reviewers reports back and the first reviewer is the kind one. They say, this is a wonderful paper or a wonderful book. This is marvellous. We should just publish this. This is great. And then reviewer two comes with, I didn't know what this author was going on about at all. And this argument is complete hogwash. And this one's already been done. And that contradicts itself and blah, blah, blah. So reviewer two has a kind of reputation. We'll see how the reviewers like my stuff. Um, 
The idea of an epiphany I want to introduce to you by an example, which comes from the beginning of my book. Um, if you, you might have seen this because I think this chapter was circulated. If you haven't seen it, don't worry. Nothing I said relies on having seen it. If you'd like to see it, then write to me. Um, if you haven't already got it, I'll happily send you a copy. Um, I think you either have or can easily get my email. So this is an example from Iris Murdoch. I'm looking out of my window, Murdoch writes, in an anxious and resentful state of mind, oblivious of my surroundings, brooding perhaps on some damage done to my prestige. Then suddenly I observe a hovering kestrel. In a moment, everything is altered. The brooding self with its hurt vanity has disappeared. There is nothing now but kestrel. And when I return to thinking of the other matter, it seems less important. So that's one example. That's from Iris Murdoch, as I say. And the second example comes from Gerard Manny Hopkins. I caught this morning morning's minion, kingdom of daylight's dauphin, dapple dawn-drawn falcon, in his riding of the rolling level underneath him steady air, and striding high there how he rung upon the rein of a wimpling wing in his ecstasy, then off, off forth on swing, as a skate's heel sweeps smooth on a bow bend, the hurl and the gliding rebuffed the big wind, my heart in hiding, stirred for a bird, the achieve of, the mastery of the thing. There are another six lines to the sonnet, but that's enough to give you the idea. These two passages point, point me to my topic. The topic is epiphanies. What is epiphany? What is an epiphany? Well, these two experiences from Murdoch and from Hopkins are reports of epiphanies. When I tell people that I'm working on epiphanies, quite a lot of people immediately know what I'm talking about. Um, it's not philosophically well, it is a philosophically technical term, but it's also one that people very widely understand. Philosophers often use words in ways that aren't quite the same as ordinary people's usage. There's a famous story about someone who, um, in, in philosophy, we, we talk a lot about the contrast between the cognitive and the conative, between, as we tend to put it, the cognitive belief and the conative desire trying to get. So uh, the story is that philosopher was... Um, in a barber's having his hair cut and the barber asked him, so what do you work on? And he said, Des desire and belief. And someone else, the barber, so asked the barber, so what that guy there, Mac, what does that guy do? He says, oh, he works on religion and sex, he said. Um, so lots of words that we philosophers use, ordinary people use in different ways, but not perhaps this one. Epiphanies is a language that people tend to understand. Epiphanies are experiences like the two I've just quoted. And if I talk not about epiphanies, but about wow moments and aha moments and eureka moments and peak experiences, even more people understand what I'm talking about. So we can begin to explain what an epiphany is by uh, what philosophers call ostension, by saying an experience like that and pointing at it. And a lot of what I do in the book I've written is about examples. It's about meditating on examples and thinking on examples. I'm actually more interested in the examples than I am in coming up with a neat definition of epiphany. And if you offer me a choice between going with the cloud of examples, the, the suite of examples that I build up in the book, between going with that and going with some definition, I'm going to go with the examples. And there's a reason for that which is fundamental to what I'm doing. I'm interested in a philosophy of experience. I'm interested in a philosophy that's true to experience. And I'm much less interested in playing a kind of parade ground logical drill game with definitions and necessary and sufficient conditions and that kind of thing. I want to get hold of realities, not philosophical abstractions. That's extremely important to me. And that dominates the way I, I do philosophy. I'm what um, I like to call an anti-theoretical philosopher, which doesn't mean that I think that philosophy shouldn't be about hard work, hard thought, abstract thought, and dealing with um, complex uh, problems, which sometimes are to do with logic and with definitions. I'm not rejecting that when I reject theory. I'm rejecting the idea that you can understand the ethical world adequately by way of a neat theoretical regimentation. The most famous neat theoretical regimentation of ethical thought is utilitarianism, 
and I absolutely reject utilitarianism. In early conversations with Barbie, I was actually going to give a talk today, which I call Futilitarianism, which is about uh, what makes utilitarianism futile, as the title suggests. One of the things that makes it futile, there are many things, but one of the things that I think is wrong with utilitarianism and, and makes it a long and struggle-filled journey in completely the wrong direction is the fact that it's an attempt to systematize ethical thought to make for example pleasure measurable when whatever else pleasure is it most certainly isn't measurable to hang everything on testing the consequences of our actions when usually we don't know what the consequences of our actions are going to be and when in any case it's impossible um, in any situation of choice to draw up a list of all the alternatives that we could go for and assign a value in consequential terms to each of those. I don't want to go on about utilitarianism today because Barbie and I decided by email that I talk about epiphanies instead. But I do want to draw a contrast between the way I want to do philosophy um, and in particular ethics and the way a lot of people want to do ethics. People in general in philosophy want to do ethics by finding a moral theory and defending that single true moral theory against all comers. So whether it's Kantianism or virtue ethics or contractarianism or intuitionism or utilitarianism, they want to be the, the only game in town. They want to come up with the only view uh, that's left standing. After all the other pugilistic views have been knocked down, there's just this one true view left standing, and that's the one we should believe. I'm not into that kind of um, uh, monomania in philosophy. I'm not into that attempt to find a single true view which captures everything. I'm rather more Wittgensteinian perhaps. Wittgenstein said there isn't one technique in philosophy. There isn't a philosophical method. There are methods, plural, and they do different work in different areas. I'm more pluralistically minded like that. And so one thing, it follows from that, the one thing I'm not saying is that epiphanies are the only game in town either. I'm not saying that either. There's lots of ways we can look at the life, at our experience of value, at the life that we live. Um, epiphanies is just one way of looking at it. I think it's an important and significant way, or I wouldn't have bothered to write a book about it. But I don't claim that it's the only way. And epiphanies are something you may be wondering by now. Have I ever experienced an epiphany? Have I ever had an epiphany? Um, and I ask myself that question and I come up with the experiences like one I describe in the paper. I woke up, this was in about 2015. Um, I posted about this on Facebook. I'll just read you the post. I woke up this morning in an attic room in the Good Enough Club in Mecklenburg Square in Bloomsbury. I opened the window and looked blearily out. My first impression was vague green and vague cold. Then the cold resolved itself into delightful cool breeze on a sunny London morning and the green resolved itself into the tall, mature, plain trees in the private garden in the middle of that deserted Georgian space. I was four flights up, yet my eye level seemed a little more than halfway up the Great Plains, and from root to leaf tip these huge trees were swaying gently in the wind, like giant living creatures that secretly dance. The top of a red crane visible in the distance above them was swaying too. I felt like I was on board a tall ship, in full sail. I felt like everything I was looking at was charged with life. Yet I'd walked across Mecklenburg Square a dozen or twenty times and never even noticed the trees before. So what is an epiphany? Let's have a go at, at least in the direction of finding a definition of epiphany. First thing we might say, an epiphany is a moment that makes us glad to be alive. Or another way of getting out what an epiphany is, we might ask, what are the great small pleasures of your life? What are the great small pleasures of your life? And see what people have to say about that. And maybe you'd like to think about that for yourself. What are the little things in life that make your life so much more enjoyable, but in little ways? I'm, I'm not talking about, um, I'm not talking about, uh, you know, falling in love with the, the person who comes to be your main your main love for the whole of your life. I'm talking about little things. I asked that question, what are the great small pleasures of your life? 
on Facebook. You can see I'm a bit of a social media junkie. And I got 276 six responses. A lot of them from friends who are not philosophers and who don't know my academic work. And I think that helps us to see how readily people understand the notion of an epiphany, or perhaps in this case, of a micro epiphany, and on how very widespread and frequent such experiences are. And for the record, some of the answers I got back to my question, what are the great small pleasures of life? People said things like, listening to Gorse Peapod pop in the sun, which is a sound I must have heard, but I never even noticed that that's what it was I was hearing. Folding clean laundry was another example. The taste of a really good strawberry was a great small pleasure in many people's lives. Reading in bed, peeling a ripe con conco. So this way we're getting hold of aphorisms and anecdotes and some kind of feel about what, of, for what epiphanies are. Um, but aphorisms and anecdotes, although they feed our imagination and they matter because they help us to build up a stock of examples and just in a sidebar here, whenever we study any philosophical question, um, we come to that question, uh, whatever the question may be, take, take whichever vexed um, question of philosophy you like. Um, should abortion be legal? Uh, should fox hunting be legal? Um, what do we think about people who break their promises? Uh, should there be capital punishment? Um, what about all these immigrants? To take a question that has rather dominated British political life in the last four years. When we come to questions of ethics like these, and many others, of course, our imaginations are dominated by the suite of examples that we, individually and personally, bring to considering those questions. So people who've had different experiences react ethically differently. Um, react, react differently to the same ethical problem. And that sounds like a truism and a platitude, and perhaps it is, but it's a really important one. And what it means is that whenever we consider a philosophical question in ethics, we need to get some kind of control, uh, some kind of self-awareness perhaps, about what our imaginations are doing with that question, about how we're thinking about it. So for example, um, I'm transgender, and there's a lot of debate um, these days, as you may have noticed, about trans women like me. And I think uh, there's a strong association between a lot of people's negative responses to trans women and to trans people in general. I think there's a strong association between their negative responses in a lot of cases, and their having themselves experienced, it's particularly to trans women, they're themsel they themselves having experienced male violence. So I think a lot of the people who are most fervently opposed to allowing trans women to be recognised as women, allowing trans women a place in society, a lot of the people who are most fervently opposed have their reasons for being so opposed. And one interesting example of this is someone who became very prominent over last summer talking about trans matters, namely JK Rowling. And I don't know if you saw her blog post about trans women, but it, it struck me immediately that she said that she was coming at this from her own experience and that before she talked about trans women and why she struggles with the appearance of trans women much more visibly in society because society has got more accepting of us, she struggles with that, she pretty well explicitly said, because she has a background in which she has been subjected to male violence. Um, Okay, end of diversion. The point of that whole diversion, it's rather a serious topic and rather a big topic, but the point of the diversion is that when we consider ethical questions, our imaginations are already charged. We don't come to these questions with some kind of neutral alien perspective. We come to them, we come to these questions from our own backgrounds, with our own perspectives, with our heads full of examples of what we're talking about, and so what seems absurd to us seems perfectly natural to someone else and vice versa because our stocks of examples are different. Now, one reason I'm raising this um, is because I think philosophers don't pay enough attention to this sort of priming, framing, background condition on our discourse. We think we can talk in some um, airy, 
rational way about big ethical questions um, as if we were starting from some neutral, some safe neutral place where these questions were just, as they say, academic questions. Almost nobody does that uh, with any philosophical question. And if they do, they are probably not the best person to talk to about it. What we need to do is bring together those who do have impassioned perspectives and get them to get to a place where they feel safe getting to understand each other's perspectives. Okay, so the reason why I'm talking about that is because in this book um, I talk a lot about epiphanies using examples and the range of examples that we bring to the discussion I'm saying is absolutely crucial. Okay, back to the project of defining um, what an epiphany is. Um, you can look up the word epiphany in dictionaries. I looked it up in the American dictionary Merriam-Webster. Um, it notes that epiphany is a church festival. The festival, um, you may see pictures like this in religious contexts of Jesus being presented to um, sometimes to the, the Magi, the three kings. Uh, so I should have given this talk on January the 6th, shouldn't I? I talk about epiphanies on epiphany. Um, the first manifestation of Christ to the Gentiles, i.e. to people who are not Jewish. Um, an appearance or manifestation, especially of a divine being, that's the second meaning of epiphany. Third, says Marian Wester, an epiphany is a usually sudden manifestation or perception of the essential nature or meaning or something. And again, it's an intuitive grasp of reality through something, usually simple and striking. And again, it's an illuminating discovery, realization or disclosure. Um, now, obviously, it's the latter sort of meanings that I'm mainly talking about when I talk about epiphany. I'm not talking about, not talking primarily about events like uh, the Christ child being seen by the three, by, by the however many wise men. Although I suppose I could run in the other direction and say, if that event, the, the Christian epiphany is meaningful, if it makes sense, then it makes sense because it's an epiphany. It's a revelation of something striking and imported, important. Epiphanies are um, insights and experiences that are given and that just come to us. And that word given, you might want to say given by whom? And here we come again to the religious overturns of the word. If you're someone who, um, like me, is a theist, then you might well say that epiphanies are insights, experiences, flashes of value in the world that we're given by God. Well, that's roughly what I would say myself, but you don't have to understand that talk of giving as the theist naturally takes it as talk of being given something by God. Um, you don't have to take it that way. You can also understand this notion of the world just giving us free gifts, beautiful things that we just see um, as if they come from the world rather than from God. So here's another example. I mean, the, the Mecklenburg Square example that I gave a minute ago, perhaps helps to bring this out. Sometimes we just get um, a hedonic free lunch. We just get a whole bunch of beautiful, pleasant experiences that just bang, come into our life from nowhere for no good reason. It's like you walk into a shop and the shop smells beautifully of coffee. Out of nowhere, you get this random um, occurrence of beauty in your life. Or you look out of the window and a flower has come into bloom and there's this beautiful purple cyanothus flower which has popped up in the garden when you weren't looking and it's a kind of grace it's a kind of freely given gift the world or god or whatever just produces for you that's the kind of thing that i have in mind when i talk about epiphanies and so we can also say using another religious word we can say that epiphanies are graces they're gifts from the world freely given gifts um, I said before that epiphanies are things that make us glad to be alive. Think of Bertrand Russell's alleged quip that the trouble with being an atheist is that you have nobody to thank for a beautiful spring morning. This capacity for joy and a corresponding facility to do things on the basis of epiphanies received that would otherwise have been undoable, it's a kind of energy that comes into us and it creates a kind of freedom. Um, But let me try 
about halfway through my talk now, let me try and offer a definition of epiphany that um, serves my purposes rather than the purposes of Merriam-Webster, the dictionary writer, or the purposes of people who want to do paintings of the, the Magi at the Cradle of Christ. My definition of epiphany is going to be something like this. An epiphany is an overwhelming, existentially significant manifestation of value in experience, often sudden and surprising, sudden and surprising, which feeds the psyche, which feels like it comes from outside. It's something given relative to which I'm a passive perceiver. It teaches us something new. It takes us out of ourselves. And there's a correct and natural response to it. Often the correct response is love, often it's pity, or again, creativity. It might also be anger or reverence or awe, or a hunger to put things right, a hunger for justice, or many other things. It may be something, the epiphany may be something, that leads directly to action or new knowledge, but it may also be something that prompts further contemplation or reflection. Other responses, again, are also possible. Now that's as near as I want to get to defining what an epiphany is. And you'll notice that it's not necessary in sufficient conditions. That is to say, I'm not saying that nothing is an epiphany unless it satisfies all these conditions I've just given. And um, if it satisfies all these conditions that I've just given, then it has to be an epiphany. I'm not giving necessary and sufficient conditions for epiphanies in that sense. It's not drawing a clear black, right, black line around a box um, such that everything inside that box is definitely epiphany and everything outside that box is definitely not epiphany. Rather, epiphany, as I want to understand the concept, is a focal case concept. There are clear and central cases of epiphanies like the ones, the examples I've already given, but there are less clear and less central cases of epiphany, which we might still want to call epiphanies, or there again might not. It doesn't actually matter all that much where we draw the boundaries around the proper use of the term epiphany. The central territory of the concept isn't threatened by demarcation disputes around its borders. There are grey areas and they have their interest. And another kind of grey area, I spoke of micro epiphanies a little bit ago. I spoke about the great small pleasures of our lives and some of those perhaps aren't big enough to count as epiphany. Um, there are no non stipulative necessary and sufficient conditions for some things being a mountain. Um, and that doesn't matter because we know a mountain when we see one, we like to say. Although, of course, with marginal cases of mountains, that's not so clear. Is it a mountain or a hill? Is it a hill or is it a, a field with a slope on it? That kind of thing. Um, the category of the mountains fades out around its edges into small scale phenomena, literally small scale. That doesn't stop alpinists from climbing mountains. Um, likewise with epiphanies, epiphanies fade out around the edges into other phenomena which are less um, interesting perhaps, um, but that doesn't stop us saying and knowing when we have had a really significant and really central epiphany. And that makes sense of picking up a term that Abraham Maslow used um, in a book called Peak Experiences, the term peak experiences, we can say that epiphanies are the peaks in our experience. So to study epiphanies, here's the corollary of that, to study our epiphanies, the peak experiences is also, also to study the troughs and the plains. Um, to come over all liturgical again, every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill laid low. Um, we get the whole continuum together in thinking about what is epiphanic, we're thinking about what is less epiphanic um, necessarily because experience is a continuum. It's like a line on a graph and we're interested in the low points on that graph as well as in the high points on that graph. Now there are lots of different ways for there to be peaks and troughs in the vividness of our experience or in the delightfulness of our experience or in the lucidity of our experience, or in the degree of emotional charge, and various kinds of emotional charge, of course, there's horror, there's terror, there's anger, there's pleasure, there's joy, there's wistfulness. There's lots and lots of ways in which an experience can be intense. Um, lots of kinds of experiential peaks might be called epiphanic. 
and there are plenty um, plenty of other ways they haven't already discussed for um, things to be intense or peak experiences. That's not a problem for my inquiry, it's a ground condition for it. And that's because the whole interest um, of my inquiry into epiphanies is to inquire into the whole experiential continuum in which epiphanies are the peaks. The real object of my inquiry is not just epiphanies, but the whole planum, the whole continuum of lived experience of which the epiphanies are parts, the peaks and the troughs and everything in between as well. Talking about epiphanies is a good way into this wider inquiry into our lived experience, but in the end it's only a way into it. The peaks in our experience could not be peaks unless there was a longer, wider story about what they are peaks in. So Murdoch's and Hopkins encounters, which I started with, their two encounters with Hawks, need to be understood against the background of the preceding narrative. And Murdoch, the way she sets up the example, uh, she provides us with some of that narrative. The narrative is that Murdoch is perhaps, has perhaps been caught up in some kind of academic um, grudge with someone else. She's been brooding on some damage done to her reputation, as she takes it to be. And then the narrative is interrupted or suspended. Um, Murdoch is suddenly taken out of herself by the sight, the beautiful sight, of this hovering kestrel. And likewise with Hopkins, um, he's suddenly overwhelmed by the wind hover. Um, and in the sonnet, in, in a past the sonnet that I didn't read, Hopkins talks about how this moment um, comes to him as a moment, um, it's, it's like a cup of water to a weary man. Hopkins is worn down by these stresses and strains of his ordinary life and seeing um, the Windhofer is a moment of delight for him, which gives him spiritual refreshment, which brings him out of that dark, dull place that he's been. In, all, in these cases and others too, there's a story behind the epiphany. And that's one way in which, as I was saying a minute ago, I want to see epiphanies as the peaks in a continuum, the peaks in a kind of experience. Um, so, um, so that's the, the background to what I'm talking about. Um, what I'm looking to develop is not just an ethics of epiphanies, although it is that, but an ethics of the phenomena of lived experience as a whole, an ethics of sensibility. And I want to try putting this another way. Thomas Nagel, as you may or may not know, very famously asked the question, what is it like to be a bat? What, what is it like to be a creature with very different sensory awareness from ours? Because our um, first sensory modality is that of vision. I think you'll probably agree with me. The thing, the sense that is most developed in us is our sight. Um, it's not an accident that for most of us, the prime way in which we read books is using our eyes. We only use Braille. Um, I, I mean no offense by saying this, but in general, human beings do not use Braille unless they need to because their eyes don't work well enough for them to read in the normal way. So when people were developing the technology, the information technology that we think of as books, what they developed was something that could be read. We didn't start with Braille and then move on to things we can see rather than touch. As an alternative to Braille, we started with what can be read because our eyes are our primary sense. For the bat, its primary sense is its ability to echolocate. So Thomas Nagel's question is, what, Thomas Nagel's question is, what is it like to be a bat? Meaning, what would it be like to be a creature whose experience was shaped by a sense which is so fundamentally different from anything that we human beings have? Because, Nagel says, human beings can't echolocate. We certainly don't see the world in terms of echolocation. We don't move through space by making boop, boop, boop noises which echo off the, the surfaces around us and enable us to gauge how far away they are and to build up by that emission of high, high frequency pulses uh, bounced back to us. In that way, a bat builds up a picture, as it were. You see, we immediately use visual imagery. Um, of the space around it. That's not how, how we operate. So Nigel asks, what is it like to be a bat? What is it like to have that very different experience from ours? And Nagel says, 
the, the conclusion in Nagel's essay is human beings are very different from bats. We have our world, which is basically a sensory world, and that means built on our senses, sensory with respect to our senses. So what it's like to be a bat is very different from what it's like to be a human. My question in this book is, what is it like to be a human though? I think Nagel is right to say that there's something about the subjective, which is different for us and different for other species and can't easily be compared as between species. That's all fine, I don't disagree with that, except on the minor technical point that actually human beings can echolocate. And if you ever go caving, um, or if you're unfortunate enough to go blind, or to, to be born blind, then um, your experience of the world may well involve a lot more echolocation than Nagel took account of in his original essay. I'm sure he's recognised this point by now, about, about 50 years after writing the essay. But actually human beings can echolocate, we're just not very good at it. We have a very rudimentary sense of how to do that. And when we're caving, if, the, um, if our head torches fail, then cavers do regularly use echolocation to get a sense of where they are and how they're going to get out of this fine mess they're in because their torches have failed three miles underground or whatever it is. And all of us, I mean, we, we all know if we're moving through a dark space, we know when we've passed through a small doorway into a much larger space, um, as it were, into, you know, through the porch and into an empty. Well, 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 think about this yourself. I've, I've done this. Maybe you have too. I've been in a, a, a disused church at night um, with no lights on, so I could hardly see what I was doing. I knew perfectly well when I came through the porch into the main body of the church because I could feel the difference in temperature, the difference in the air currents around me, and above all, the difference in the echo, the difference in the sonic features of the space I was in. Now that is me echolocating, so we can echolocate, but I'm getting distracted by this because the real point I want to be making here is Nagel is writing very interestingly about what it's like to be a bat, but I want to pay more attention to what it's like to be a human being, because I want to say this, this is the whole point of my book, that what it is like to be a human being, what our experience of the world is like from our point of view, is actually decisive for our ethical understanding of the world. And I come back here to the point I was making before, you could call it the sampling point. We base our understanding on what we have experienced. And that means um, that when we come to an ethical problem, there's a suite of examples already there in our heads. It also means that our whole understanding of the world and of value is based upon our distinctive way of experiencing the world. And what I love about Nagel's essay, what I think is really great about it, is the way in which he brings out the fact that different kinds of creatures are going to have different styles of experiencing the world. On that, I absolutely agree with Nagel. I think that's absolutely right. Now, if I'm right that what matters in ethics is not to have an abstract theory, um, utilitarianism or Kantianism or whatever, which you can just impose from above, you can just drop it in on ethic, any, any ethical problem. If I'm right that what matters for ethics is our experience taken from the inside out, so I, I, as I say, I want to do ethics from the inside out, not from the outside in. I want to do ethics starting from where we are and what we are and how we experience the world. If I'm right that epiphanies are the peaks in our experience and that what is ethically significant is our, um, is our experience, um, that it's all right there in how we picture the world, then it matters enormously to understand more detail about what it's like to understand the world. And that is why um, I think it's crucial to do what philosophers call phenomenology, the study of experience. This is something that they're much better at in the French uh, and German traditions than we are in Britain. So Heidegger and Sartre in particular are great phenomenologists, so is Levinas. So um, in a rather different way, a very interestingly different way, um, are Honet and Habermas and Gadamer in German philosophy. In Britain, we've been rather starved of thinking clearly and um, creatively 
about um, the particularities of human experience. Philosophers in English speaking countries have just tended to say, yes, well, humans have all these experiences and um, that's all very fine and good, but how does it fit into our theory? Um, and that seems to me to be the wrong approach because of the last bit. We should be looking more closely at the experience and trying to get the truth about what our experience is like. We shouldn't be worrying too much about whether that experience fits into a theory. Because if the experience doesn't fit into a theory, then hang the theory. Keep the experience. Theory is in no position to judge experience. Experience is the test of whatever usefulness theory may have. So theories may work okay in particular situations for particular circumstances, but they're, they're a bit like, I don't know, bus timetables. So if you have some particular purpose in mind, like catching a bus, then a bus timetable is a handy thing to have to hand. But you can't run your whole life on the timetable for the 22A, and it would be ridiculous to try. You need a much broader and a much more flexible um, toolbox to deal with life as a whole. And that, I think, is where philosophy, as we often do it in Britain and America in particular, tends to go wrong. We're not flexible enough and we're too, um, we're too single technique in our approach. We think there's just one technique which will solve all problems. And that seems to me completely the wrong way to look at things. So if this book works out, it's going to be fairly revolutionary because it's a very different approach to philosophy from the standard approaches that most other people are taking in philosophy as it's written in English speaking countries at the moment. So um, with any luck, what I'm saying here in this book will catch on. But the first test of whether it will catch on is audiences like yourselves, to whose tender mercies I now submit myself. Thank you for listening.